Okay, for th this session, we are s switching back to look at another form of very, very important renewable energy technologies uh, and, and a resource that, again, is available all over the country, and it actually uh, is a family of technologies that can be tapped in many ways, and uh, you will hear here, as we have been hearing from so many other uh, people, that there are real jobs, huge economic benefits um, that accrue to communities uh, across the country as a result of the uh, development and the deployment of these important uh, resources. So in this session, we will start off by hearing from Linda church Chachi, who is Executive Director of the National Hydropower Association and then she will be followed by Gia Schneider, uh, who is with Natal Energy. And then um, our third speaker will be Sean O'Neill, who is the president of Ocean Renewable Energy Coalition. Linda. Thank you, Carol. Well, it's exciting to see all of you here to hear a little bit more about uh, renewable energy and to see the excitement in the room and to see all the people that have been packing in this room over the course of the day. Well, hydropower is probably the oldest renewable resource and it's one of our youngest renewable resources, as Sean will be talking about in a moment. I'll talk to you just a little bit about who NHA is. We're the National Trade Association that represents the hydroelectric industry. We represent conventional hydropower, pump storage, which is becoming increasingly more important today. And then we also have members who are involved in new technologies of ocean tidal and in-stream hydrokinetic, and we work very closely with OREC on issues of importance to that segment of the water power industry. We have 180 member companies. They span the breadth of the electric industry, include public, investor-owned, IPP, as well as we have members from the manufacturing and the service industry. Quick few facts about hydro. It is our largest renewable energy resource today. Uh, it represents 61% of renewable energy, and it's producing as of March of this year, because we've had a great high water year, 8.2% of all of our electric generation. Unlike a lot of other renewables, it also has a diversity of ownership including the federal government. The federal government actually is responsible for 51% of hydropower generation through the Bureau of Reclamation, the Corps of Engineers, and TVA. And though the federal government owns a large share of that generation, it has few projects, and that's because they're very large projects. So you often think of hydropower in the sense of Grand Coulee or the Hoover Dam. And because of that, I think there's been a myth that hydropower in the United States is tapped out, that we've used the best facilities already, and I think that's because we think of building these large federal facilities. But in actuality, hydropower is very small. The average project is actually under 30 megawatts. In fact, the vast majority of hydro in the United States is under 30 megawatts. So try to keep that in mind as you think about the growth opportunities there are in the industry. The hydro industry is poised today to double its current contribution to bring another 90,000 megawatts to the grid over the next 25, uh, over the next several decades. We are building already around the country, bringing economic opportunity, clean and affordable energy, and most importantly, jobs. Hydro, we believe, is the cornerstone of our new renewable energy future. And that's what I want to talk about today. Hydropower has a tremendous opportunity to grow and to expand and to help America meet its low carbon future. If, we, uh, if you look at a recent study that was just released in April of this year by Oak Ridge National Laboratory, it found that 13,000 megawatts of conventional hydropower capacity could be added to the grid without building a single new dam, simply just building on existing non-powered dams in this country. In fact, only 3% of the 80,000 dams in the United States currently produce power. So there's a tremendous amount of growth opportunity as a result. We also are seeing growth opportunities by seeking efficiency improvements on the existing hydroelectric system that's upgrading existing facilities uh, and developing pump storage, tidal, wave, hydrokinetic, 
in ocean current and conduit energy that Gia will be talking to you about in a moment. We can add at least, at a minimum, another 49,000 megawatts of hydropower by adding those technologies, building out those technologies by 2025. So the growth that we're seeing is real, and we're seeing a real renaissance of hydro in the U.S. In fact, there's currently over 89,000 megawatts of new hydropower projects sitting before the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission as I speak. That's the agency that currently that has responsibility to license these projects. And this is not relicensing any of the existing system. This is actually new projects that are under consideration today. So the Oak Ridge study has shown that significant gener there's significant generation benefit by building out this hydro system. But there's also a tremendous economic return as well as an environmental return. If you look at the Oak Ridge Lab uh, report, it shows that the biggest projects are in the south, the Midwest, and the Rust Belt. These are areas that have been hardest hit by the recession. They also are areas where there hasn't been a lot of renewable energy growth. So what we see is by building out these uh, projects that have been identified in the Oak Ridge Laboratory, we have the potential to bring renewable energy to those regions of the country, retire some of the older aging plants that we have, many of which obviously are coal in that region, helping us get to a cleaner energy future. The uh, Navigant study that was released in 2009 has shown that every region of the country will benefit if we develop this existing potential hydro. In fact, it showed that we could create actually 1.4 million jobs across America by building out this system. And these are good paying jobs with wide diversity, both blue collar and white collar. But one thing that study also showed us is that the policy matters. In fact, by taking away some of the policies where it's actually spurred some of this growth and development over this last several years, what we found is that those growth opportunities dropped by two thirds. So what exactly are we looking for in terms of policy to spur hydro growth? Well, first, you've already heard this. You've heard this from the other renewables. We need long-term extension of the incentive programs for renewable energy, the production tax credit, the investment tax credit, and the Section 1603 program has also been important. Now, why is the long-term extension important to us? Because it takes a while to build a hydropower plant. It takes a while to license it. So if you don't have a three to five to six or eight year window, you're not gonna see this growth and development occur. And what happens is that we see projects actually being put back on the shelf. We also are urging Congress to pass the Hydropower Improvement Act that uh, was just recently reported out of the Senate, uh, Senate Energy Committee uh, that will actually look at building a smarter regulatory processing system, process, process for the hydro licensing uh, because, again, it takes just too long for us to license these projects. We're not asking to roll back any environmental law. We're just looking at integrating these processes and making them work faster and more expedited. We also need R&D funding, and we're grateful for the House Appropriations Action yesterday that reported out another $50 million for the hydro water power uh, program within the DOE. It's been a very, very important program in terms of spurring these new advances in technology as well as doing an awful lot of uh, the assessment work that's so necessary to look at growth and development. I just want to conclude with just a few examples of what's happening. In Pennsylvania, PPNL is adding another 100, it's a 108 megawatt project currently. It's adding 125 megawatts of uh, power to, a new pro to its existing facility that's over 100 years old. And it will be powering another 100,000 homes. In Hastings, Minnesota, they've created 61 jobs uh, across the United States and just building a new hydrokinetic technology uh, there uh, on an existing dam. In Ohio, we have four new projects that are being built by AMP, all on existing core dams, and the projects have spurred the opening of a new manufacturing plant. For the first time, we're seeing a manufacturing plant being built in the United States for hydro turbines in a very, very long time. And new development's not the only way where we're seeing this economic return. There's refurbishment of the existing system, the aging system of hydro going on. 19 projects are currently producing 
$3.5 billion of economic investment that, was, that actually affects across the country from Oregon to Pennsylvania. So there's a lot happening right now in hydropower. I urge you to and welcome you to look at, at our, uh, our uh, website, uh, www.hydro.org. We also are outside uh, exhibiting today. We're happy to answer any of your questions and look forward to talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I run a company called Natel Energy, which is based in the Bay Area uh, in California. And we are commercializing, we're a relatively, relatively young company uh, that is commercializing a new low head hydropower technology. It's a new turbine designed specifically to work in sites that uh, have less than 20 feet of head or 20 feet of drop. So the range for us is 5 to 20 feet. Um, we have chosen as a first market on which to focus to be the constructed waterway or the conduit market uh, that Linda re referenced earlier. And the reason for that is it's mo located mostly in the western U.S. Um, and characterized by uh, irrigation districts, municipal water supply facilities, w wastewater treatment plants, various sorts of industrial flow settings. The reason for focusing on that is we think it's a relatively significant uh, chunk of new generation that could be added to the grid, uh, maybe as much as about 5,000 megawatts. It's not the end-all, be-all market, but it is a particular uh, niche where uh, there's a lot of aging infrastructure, again, particularly in the western U.S., uh, that will have billions of dollars invested into it over the next couple decades to upgrade it. Uh, and what we do is we offer an alternative that helps turn those infrastructure upgrades or infrastructure investments into revenue-generating assets for those entities in question. Um, we currently have a project online that has been grid connected for about a year down in Arizona with an irrigation district. That project uses our smallest commercial unit, which is a 40 kilowatt unit. And again, like I said, it's been grid connected for about a year, generating electricity, selling that electricity to Arizona Public Service. We have two more projects uh, which should go to installation using our mid-range sized unit, which is a 400 kilowatt unit. And those will go to construction sometime this winter to early spring next year. And then after that, we expect to bring to market a two megawatt unit, uh, which will a two megawatt unit in about 2013. And that unit really transitions us out of this kind of initial niche market into what we consider um, a kind of certainly a lar larger potential, uh, longer term market. And that's looking at the existing dams. As Linda referenced, there are 80,000 of them roughly uh, in the U.S. Most of them don't produce power. Of those 80,000, about half, so about 42,000 are less than 25 feet tall, and almost none of them produce power. Most of the power-producing ones are the ones that are higher, uh, that are bigger dams. So that's another big chunk of potential, um, and that starts to get us out of talking from, you know, 100 kilowatts up to a couple megawatts per site to where you're talking tens of megawatts per site. To give you a reference in terms of what this means, going back to the constructed waterway space, in the constructed waterway space, when we're talking with irrigation districts, we're looking at sites that are anywhere, uh, anywhere from, say, 100 to 200 megawatts, or sorry, 100 to 200 kilowatts, up to a couple megawatts in size. And then in aggregate potential across a district, you may have as many as 20 or 30 megawatts. When you move into the existing dam space, and you start talking about big structures on, on, on rivers, locks and dams, that kind of thing, that's where you start talking at anywhere from 10 to maybe as much as 50 or 60 megawatts per drop or per, per um, existing structure. So again, we have been fortunate to receive uh, about $1.1 million in SBIR funding through, from the DOE, so a you know, uh, program both supported by SBIR as well as, as through DOE. Uh, that's been really crucial for us in the process of scaling up to the 400 kilowatt unit, which will go out again into its first projects later this year. Um, and you know, definitely welcome the action that Linda referenced uh, yesterday in the House. Um, that kind of support is definitely critical to help bolster investor confidence. We are a privately funded company. We have outside investors. But certainly that kind of buy, additional buy-in and support from the Department of Energy uh, on the R&D side is critical to helping us kind of catalyze and raise additional investment. Uh, in addition, we absolutely support uh, clean energy policy. That is very critical on the project side. Uh, for those of us or those of y'all who have experience kind of out on the ground looking at trying to get new projects installed right now, right now is actually a particularly tough time because energy prices are quite are low. And they're not as low as they were back in 2008. But if you're looking at siting a project and trying to finance a project and bring it online, independent of whether or not you're dealing with new technology, power prices in many parts of the country are, are quite low. And as such, when you're looking at doing power offtake agreements and therefore trying to finance, um, it, it is definitely a challenging environment. 
incentives and programs that have kind of lend some sort of long-term certainty to returns on those investments are definitely crucial to kind of continuing to spur investment from the private sector to come into this space to get projects you know, in the ground, get new technologies in the ground. That being said, I think that uh, at the same time, you know, smart design of those uh, incentive programs is important uh, because at the end of the day, what we want to see is we want to see renewable energy compete on a cost basis uh, with fossil fuels. So I think that a lot of the discussion that has, uh, has been going on and we hope will continue to go on is really crucial in terms of designing good incentive programs that help get new technologies out into the ground um, producing energy, but again with a really strong focus on, on driving down costs. It's one of the areas where I think some of the work that's being undertaken at the DOE in terms of um, their review of, of how they look at funding new technologies is really important. And that's been a bit of a shift, I think, in the DOE's program is to really start to you know, baseline how they're looking at um, making almost investments again and bringing new technologies to market to really focus on, on cost and delivered cost of energy. Um, I think uh, when we look at the potential for hydropower, just to kind of you know, frame of reference for us, we, what we do specifically is we are a new technology, a new kind of turbine, um, which in, in a space that has been around for a long time, I think it's a space of the renewable energy um, technology uh, area that people haven't really associated with, with being one that is ripe for innovation um, and opportunity. Uh, I would say what we saw is we saw an opportunity to say, how do we create a design or machine that works efficiently and is super cost effective to deal with large volumes of water at low pressures or low heads? We set out to solve that. And as such, you know, we, we think that we play a, we, we bring a new tool to the toolbox when it comes to thinking about how we actually, you know, get that 90 gigawatts or so of, of new hydro developed here in the U.S. So really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thanks. Great job. Great. Thanks. I think I'll follow Gia's lead here. Um, there's over 100 marine and hydrokinetic type devices being looked at in the world right now. In the United States, there's about 37. These are devices that make power from the motion of the ocean, whether it be waves or tides, um, ocean thermal differentials, and, and even osmotic, where they use something akin to a reverse osmosis process. Uh, the Danes are actually looking at that right now. It's very far from commercial. But when we look at the, the hydrokinetic, the, the wave and tidal um, energy devices here in the United States, we've got a couple of companies that are really starting to catch us up in the worldwide search to commercialize marine and hydrokinetics. Um, we've got Ocean Power Technologies in New Jersey. We've got Ocean Renewable Power Company up in Maine, and we've got Verdant Power, which puts six turbines in the East River of New York City. But when we look at the entire context of what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now, it's a tough year. It's a very tough year. And when we heard from the combined heat and power folks just a few minutes ago, they were talking about the full context of how we look at energy how we use energy and um, the forms that it comes in and whether we should be wasting the heat or putting that to good work. And I think with cogeneration, that's a great idea. But with marine and hydrokinetic energy, we're looking at not just carbon-free, we're looking at emission-free energy. And that goes with the, the other renewables, just like conventional hydro and wind. It just happens to be that CO2 is the most sexy of the emissions right now. But when you think about it, you've got CO2, you've got SO2, you've got nitrogen oxides, you've got trace metals, you've got mercury. So we need to start factoring that into how we evaluate the bets that we make on energy production. And when I come to, I think this is our fifth year at the Sustainable Energy Coalition's um, Hill Day. And I look around at the people, and we're all trying to solve specific problems, and we get very focused on the task at hand, whether that means the extension of the production tax credit or the very innovative thing that came up a couple of years ago where you could take the investment tax credit and take it to the Treasury and cash it in for a grant. 
and not have to go out into the private sector and compete for uh, the tax um, benefits there. But when you look at all the people that are in this room and in the other room over there, we forget sometimes that, yes, we've got to finish the task at hand, but the broader context of what we're talking about is that there's no drilling, there's no mining, there's no processing, there's no refining, there's no transportation of fuel. The catastrophic potential for something like a BP oil spill or a Fukushima nuclear power plant with marine and hydrokinetic technologies. When you think about things like risk communication or risk-informed decision-making, the three things that come to mind, what can go wrong, how likely is it, and what are the consequences? Well, in the case of marine and hydrokinetic power, not a whole lot can go wrong. It's not very likely. And even if it all went to hell in a handbasket, there wouldn't be a lot of consequences. You'd have some debris on the bottom of the ocean. And quite frankly, we've got a lot of debris on the bottom of the ocean right now. So when you put these devices in, you also have the unintended potential benefits. Uh, we look at um, sunken ships that create entire ecosystems. And the fish love them. All of the different species love to swim around these sunken ships. Yet when we look at um, other types of uh, factors that go into a new industry, marine and hydrokinetics, we're discovering so many things that when you marinize power production, it, you run into all kinds of new um, factoids and, and things that go on, like the debate about whether or not a, a, an old oil rig should be decommissioned or not. The, there's a debate right now that you shouldn't decommission them because you've got an art, artificial reef and fish like to procreate around them. So there's an entire world that we're dealing with here, and we are really trying to find solutions to many problems and leverage our knowledge in one sector into another. We've learned so much from conventional hydro, from NASA, from aerospace, from shipping, uh, from onshore wind. So I just want everybody to think about the great work that you all are doing right now in the context of a better tomorrow. Thanks.